and uh, turn it over to Alice Howard. Alice. Uh, hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to the fifth uh, RPA lecture of the season. Uh, I'm Alice Howard, the RPA board member, and I've been uh, organizing these lectures. Uh, we hope uh, that you and yours are all well. Unfortunately, we can't get together these days, and so we're really pleased to be able to bring you our lectures virtually. This year, the focus has been on um, looking at some conservation issues, and we've had talks on climate change, forest regeneration, wildlife conservation, trails and public access to woodlands, and uh, floodwater management will be next month. But tonight, we're going to hear about water resources and air quality presented by Fred and Barbara Nuffer. Uh, this is a husband and wife team, uh, both of whom retired from the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation, each after more than 30 years of service. Fred will go first. Uh, he served at the DEC as director of the Bureau of Flood, Flood Protection and assistant director of the Division of Water. Uh, he's the chair of the town of NASA Natural Resources Committee, among other volunteer uh, positions. And Fred will then be followed by Barbara. She worked at the DEC in various positions, including the Division of Air Resources Toxics Assessment Section. And among her various volunteer activities, Barbara is a Rensselaer County Master Gardener. So now I'd like to invite Fred and Barbara to take it from here. Thank you, Alice. Uh, as uh, Alice said, I'm going to start out and then Barb will follow me. Um, so what am I going to discuss tonight? I'm going to discuss water resources. And first, I'd like to just give you a little brief idea of what my thoughts are on water resources themselves. What are water resources? It's a broad range of things. Tonight, I'm going to primarily focus on water quality aspects of, of water resources but it's a much broader topic. Um, it covers such things as flood control, water withdrawal, drinking water supply, um, groundwater management, a whole series of things. Um, I must say that on the Rensselaer Plateau website, they have an extremely interesting presentation, a little piece on flood control on the post and kill. I would encourage you to read that. It's really an interesting proposal and I look forward to see what they're going to be doing with that in the future. Um, uh, any course that you take on public speaking, they, they kind of lay out what a public speaker should really do in his discussion. And the first thing they say is that the, the speaker should really be telling everybody what he intends to tell them that evening. The next step is to go ahead and actually tell them what he wants to tell them that evening. And then when he gets done, he's supposed to tell them what he told them he wanted to tell them that evening. So we're gonna start out here and I'm gonna cover a number of topics. You know, What are the water resources on the plateau? Uh, discuss a little bit what the concepts of basins and watersheds are, and then get into some of the water quality issues on the plateau. What, you know, what is the water quality on the plateau? What are some of the threats to the water quality on the plateau and what possibly can you do to help address those? And who's responsible for carrying out water resource management activities? And to start it off, I, I think I'm gonna sing y'all a little song uh, that has to do with water quality and water resources. I don't wreck my guitar here. Okay. It starts high in the mountains to the north, crystal clear. It icily trickles forth with just a few wrappers of chewing gum. Dropped by some careless hiker for tells of what's to come. At Glens Falls, 5,000 honest hands work at consolidated paper plant. A million gallons of 
piece today. Why should we do it any other way? Down the valley, 10,000 toilet chains. Find my Hudson a convenient place to drink. Town says who me? Do you think sewage plants are free? In the ocean they say the water's clear, but I live right at Albany here, halfway between the mountains and the sea. Tack into and fro, the stock returns to me. Sailing down my dirty little stream. Still I love it, and I'll keep this dream. That someday, maybe not this year, my Hudson River will once again run clear. Well, that song was written back in the 1960s by, by Pete Seeger. And it was written primarily to help raise funds for the building of the Sloop Clearwater. And it was sung in a lot of backyard concerts, including right here on the plateau at Fox Hollow. Um, that's really, that's out on Route 2 in Petersburg. Um, that's where that song really helped raise my environmental consciousness actually, and kind of sent me on this path of, of uh, environmental um, planning and in, environmental uh, protection. That, that's how I got into this. It was really about that time in the 1960s when the Pure Waters Bond Act came into being uh, in 1965 actually, that's when the state of New York passed a multi-million dollar in fact, it may have been a billion dollar um, bond act proposal to help build sewage treatment plants all over the state, including here in the Albany area and, and Troy as well. Um, so what really are the water resources on, on the plateau? No. And how much water do we really receive each year? Well, um, the plateau gets about 43 inches of rain or precipitation. Um, that's both wet and snow, and it all comes down to about 43 inches, which is it's just over three and a half feet of, uh, of water. Now, the plateau is approximately 30 miles long, and it averages about six miles wide, so that's 180 square miles. When you translate that all out, that's um, almost uh, 28 million square feet. So that means that over those, each one of those square feet, three and a half feet of water piles up. When you look at what a cubic foot of water can hold, it holds approximately seven and a half gallons of water. So when you do the math and you calculate it all out, the plateau receives about 130 billion gallons of water each year. That's a lot of water. And that's actually the equivalent of taking the Tamahannock Reservoir and dumping it on the plateau 10 times. So what happens to that water? And this is where I'm gonna put up a slide that uh, shows the, the drainage basins within the plateau itself. Next one down. We're almost there. Next one down. Can you see that note on the top about audio settings, everybody? I don't know if people can see that or not. Okay. So anyway, there's there is an image um, of the various water basins within the plateau itself. Uh, can you make that image smaller so that people can see the whole thing? Okay. So, um, um, so what happens to that water? Well, uh, a lot of it is held in the soil and the many wetlands throughout the plateau. And it's taken up by the various plants and the trees and given back to the atmosphere as part of the transpiration cycle. 
And some of it goes back into the atmosphere by evaporation as part of the continuing hydraulic cycle, hydrologic cycle, excuse me. Some of it seeps down through the surface soils and into the cracks and fissures to the bedrock to become part of the unconsolidated aquifers. Now unconsolidated as opposed to consolidated aquifers, which are found in uh, coarse gravels and sand deposits. There are some in the plateau, but it's primarily bedrock with uh, fissures and those are considered unconsolidated aquifers. The remainder of it runs off into these various lakes and ponds and streams, but eventually finds its way to two major river basins, the upper Hudson Basin and the lower Hudson Basin. So all the water on the plateau, literally all the water on the plateau either flows into the upper Hudson or the lower Hudson. Now those are separated really by the Troy Dam. And it's just the lower Hudson is the tidal affected portion of the river and above the dam obviously is not affected by the tide. So they break it into this lower and upper basin. Um, the federal dam is, is really what separates those two, the tidal and the, and the upper portion. So there are, there are actually 17 major river basins in New York State. New York State is often referred to as a headwater state because there are so many major rivers that flow out of New York into other, other states themselves. We have the Hudson River, which is shared by New Jersey. We have the Delaware River, which is shared by New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Delaware. We have the Susquehanna, which is shared by Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Virginia. Um, and uh, we have the Allegheny, which is part of the Ohio system, which flows south into the um, oh, into the Mississippi, excuse me, I just lost my train of thought there. So um, Rent, the Rensselaer Plateau is actually the headwaters for a majority of all the waters and streams that flow um, throughout Rensselaer County itself. Um, and we're gonna take a look now at the actual um, basin here or the watersheds, um, you'll see that the in the, the middle portion of the um, of the eastern side of this map, you have both the Poston Kill and Winan Skill, which flow off the plateau, flow west, and both of those flow into the lower portion, the lower basin of the of the Hudson. Um, the streams on the northeastern side of the plateau from about Berlin North flow into the Little Hoosick subwatershed along Route 22 and then into the Hoosick River um, and then eventually into the Upper Hudson Basin through the, uh, where the, um, it empties out into the Upper Hudson at Stillwater. It's about 20 files, 25 miles north of the Hudson. The streams on the um, far north eastern side of the plateau uh, flow directly into the Hoosick or first into the Little Hoosick and then into the Tamahannock Reservoir. Um, there's various uh, tributaries from Babcock Lake, the Skunskill Creek, Otter Creek, etc., before entering into the Hoosick River. Now the streams on the southern portion of the plateau, both on the eastern and western sides, flow eventually into the Kinderhook Creek watershed. You have uh, such sub watersheds there as the Black River, Black Creek, the Tassawasa, Pikes Pond Outlet, the Valacia Kill, and they finally flow into the lower Hudson River um, Basin at about Stockport, which is about 25 miles south of Albany. So you've got all these waters within a 50 mile range, basically either flowing north and coming out um, north of the Hudson at Stillwater, or, or excuse me, north of Albany at Stillwater, or south of Albany at Stockport. So now we're going to look at uh, and talk about how the general water quality of the plateau is. Um, in general, the water quality of the streams and the plateau is good. It's probably better today than it was a century ago, primarily because of the of a regrowth of the forest cover. 
many of the streams uh, and water bodies show no impairment or minor, minor impairment. Lakes and ponds on the plateau do show some degree of impairment, primarily because of air deposition, which Barbara is going to cover a little bit later on. Um, so let's look at a, a web tool that you can actually begin to check out how various streams on the plateau, um, how their water quality really is. If you'll see up at the upper left hand corner, it's called the DEC Info Locator. If you Google that and actually there's, um, I believe at the very top, there's an actual web address that you can find. But if you go onto the DEC website and enter DEC Info Locator, this will come up. And the first thing you need to do is click off on environmental quality and you want the mon environmental monitoring, excuse me, and you wanna check off rivers and streams, aquatic biological monitoring and aquatic toxicity monitoring. And you'll see that there are sites all across the plateau that um, studies have been done and information has been gathered. And I just happened to click specifically on Dyken Pond. Um, that particular uh, water body uh, does show in, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, Barb, you're right. I'll go to the next one. Okay, so that water body does show that, can you X that out? I'm trying. See if I can get rid of this. Okay. Can you get rid of that top piece? There we go. Um, so Dyken Pond actually is, does show that it is um, slightly impaired. Um, and it's impaired because of mercury. So from air deposition um, from the west, um, mercury has been deposited into Dyken Pond over the years, and it's impaired, it has impaired fish consumption there now. So um, there's a prohibition on eating certain species of fish and amounts of fish, uh, and it actually gives you the details on that. Uh, there are several other or, uh, bodies of water as well, Dunham Reservoir, is also impaired um, because of mercury and is also impaired for fish consumption. There's a prohibition on eating any um, walleye uh, from Dunham Reservoir at all. Um, I'm gonna look at a few additional sites that are there now, see what else I have. Um, here, I think I looked at the post and kill and the post and kill shows that um, there is no use impairment. Now, this is primarily where it, the site that it was taken is the upper post and kill. So there's, um, there's fewer chances for impairment up there. I think, I think there may be some impairment further down because of agricultural practices uh, in you know, the midsection of it so that the lower section does show some slight impairments. Um, and let's look at the next one now. And this one uh, shows the Quackenkill. And again, there, I believe there's no use of impairment on that as all, at all. Um, if you look at the the sheets there down below, it does give you an idea of what sort of, um, um, sampling techniques that they used on these various water bodies. Um, Uh, and on some of them, they basically did uh, the basic chemical analysis, which um, includes, in the field anyway, they'll take water temperature, they'll measure for dissolved oxygen, pH, specific um, conductivity, and oxygen reduction potential. 
They'll also usually take actual lab samples. They'll uh, bottle up lab samples and, and analysis will be done on phosphorus levels, nitrogen, chlorophyll, alkalinity, and organic carbon. They'll also do calcium, iron, magnesium, chloride, sulfate, silica, arsenic, and ammonia. Uh, so those, it's actually when they do those chemical analysis, that's what they're doing. But a lot of these will actually show that the, um, a more, um, a rapid assessment was done. Those rapid assessments are also referred to as kick sampling, where they actually go in and they will look at what the aquatic life is that exists in the stream. Now, a kick sample is accomplished by basically a quartering off the, the stream itself and taking various measurements across the stream and up the stream for a certain distances. Um, and then they'll they'll put all that data and information together. And what they actually do is they actually take a net uh, with two sticks. They'll put that down in the water so that they're, they're currently facing downstream and the net is down below them. And then they will literally kick the rocks. They'll kick over rocks to free up insect life and they'll capture that insect life. They'll take it out and they'll analyze it. So they're looking for a variety of insects that the greater the variety, the usually the cleaner the stream, and they're usually looking for some specific types of macroinvertebrates, uh, the types of um, um, mayflies, stoneflies, and caddisflies. Those are really what are referred to as clean water um, organisms. So the more of those you can get over that section that's been quadrant off, the, the less impacted or the better quality, though uh, water quality those streams are. So they'll, a lot of the sites you'll see um, on that map are uh, actually refer to the, um, these rapid assessment tests that are done. Um, okay, uh, Barb, can we go to the next one? Okay, um, I'll leave that one for a second. So what are some of the threats to water quality on the plateau? And I'm gonna take the macro threats that are there, the ones that are you know, large and are probably um, the, the most difficult to really deal with. And, and the first one I think Jim mentioned, or Alice mentioned that there was a discussion on this earlier, climate change is probably, you know, one of the greatest potentials for um, impacting water quality on the plateau. It uh, the changes in precipitation patterns and amount. Um, it's probably, um, so far I, I think that the, um, the projections are that we'll receive approximately the same amount of precipitation, maybe a little greater over the year, um, but tip that it's more likely to fall in larger quantity events. There'll be larger rain events and probably less snowpack and drier summers. Now that has the potential for really impacting on water quality and life within those streams as well. Um, also, air transport um, deposition. Again, Barb's going to touch on that, but we're already being impacted by that. Um, the mercury is affecting several uh, water bodies in on the plateau uh, for fish consumption. Um, and we're likely to discover, I think, as, as we get um, testing, uh, testing now is so much better. It can go down to much smaller and smaller quantities. I think we're going to find that there are legacy um, pollutants that, it, that are there that are these so-called forever chemicals that basically just don't break down, that they've been emitted for years at this point. And like PFOA, I mean, I, I, I think that we're going to find at some point there's going to be PFOA um, 
legacy forms in, in a lot of the water bodies as well. It's just that they haven't been tested at this point. Um, here are some of the more local things in which I think we may have um, more opportunity to influence. And let me caveat some of these things. Um, I have to say that I know that in our town and I suspect in every other town, some of the hardest working employees for the, for the town is, uh, are on the road crew, um, the highway department. Um, that being said, Highway maintenance, road maintenance, um, there, there are instances where um, if not done right or not planned well, the runoff from those improperly crowned or ditched roadways uh, will lead runoff directly into the streams. And that has caused problems over the years, siltation. Uh, the silt loads in some of our streams right now, our smaller streams in particular, have changed the nature of those streams. Uh, where we may have had brook trout in those streams at one point, it's difficult to find uh, those species any longer in those streams. Also, the overly liberal use of road salt near stream corridors is a problem. I think you're going to find you're going to hear more and more about this in the future. Um, right now, they um, bipartisan legislation has been passed in. Um, for some areas in the Adirondacks right now where they're going to basically look and, and see how they can adjust road sanding and salting to improve water quality and, and also drinking water. There have been wells um, in some areas that have been impacted by, by road salt as well. I think that is something that if we have uh, some honest conversations with road superintendents that, that um, some more thought um, behind where it's appropriate and where it may not be appropriate to use road salt uh, can help improve water quality within our, within our streams. Um, also, I, I'll have you know that I am a, um, a big supporter of um, timber harvesting. But again, there, um, if it's done in an improper fashion, it has the potential for significantly impacting on water quality. Um, harvesting from slopes that are too steep, harvesting and, um, and not using proper management practices um, can lead to water quality impairments. Uh, again, I think talking with town boards to make certain that they have adequate and appropriate um, pr um, requirements in town laws to, to ensure that uh, timber harvests are done in an appropriate fashion. Um, improper siting and operation of mining and, mining and extraction practices as well. Again, it's, it's something that society needs but it's also something that has to be done in an appropriate fashion so that both groundwater resources um, and surface water resources are protected. And runoff from improper development practices as well. Um, again, development is, is something that um, you know, most towns are, are looking to, to try to do, but it, it has to be done in an appropriate fashion. Uh, so ensuring that your town has appropriate development restrictions and requirements is important. Um, so the slide that you have in front of you now, um, I, I'm going to talk about who's responsible for carrying out wa um, water resource management activities on the plateau. And it really starts at the local level. Um, towns really are the first step in this process. And there are some towns who have um, environmental management groups that, that are established, who is responsible, whose responsibility includes looking at um, the environmental resources within that town to ensure that they're protected and advising the, the town board to, um, about those resources and, and where issues might exist. So that the town of Nassau has a, um, a resource management board. 
the um, let me see the uh, town of Post and Kill also has a conservation advisory board. The town of Brunswick has a stormwater um, uh, commission, and the town of Lake uh, Sand Lake has an environmental uh, open space uh, recreation committee. So all those those towns do have something. The other towns at this point don't have a unique entity set up to, to look at environmental quality issues. Um, so it, again, the, the town board and the zoning board really should be doing that, um, that sort of planning and ensuring that those resources are protected. But you may wanna have a discussion with your local town about how the, the water quality resources can be, be better protected um, it, it really goes up from there. I think also I've, I've put on there one local um, group, the Little Hoosick Watershed Association, which is um, in, the, in the town of Berlin. Um, they're really, I think, a group that's taken on the responsibility um, of looking, overseeing what goes on within that Little Hoosick Watershed to, to try to make certain that the water quality within that is, is better protected. Um, there are also some, uh, and the county health department has a role and a responsibility. The co county environmental um, management board has some responsibilities. And then at the state level, it's a myriad of groups who have responsibilities. The Department of Environmental Conservation, um, the Department of Health, um, Department of Ag and Markets, all those groups um, have responsibilities for, for looking after and protecting water resources. Um, there are some, within DEC, there are some opportunities for volunteers as well. There are two particular programs that I wanted to bring to your attention. One is called the WAVE program, and these really are um, they're looking for what they refer to as citizen scientists to, to volunteer and the WAVE program is the water assessment by volunteer evaluators. Um, every five years, the Department of Environmental Conservation Division of Water goes through what's called a rotating intensive basin survey where they look at, there, there are those 17 basins that I mentioned in order to do a, um, a good enough job to really get a sense of what's going on in those basins, they have to rotate the number of basins. That they, ha they have to select only a few of those basins each year to do a full analysis on. So the, every five years, each basin in the, in the state should have some sort of complete a review and analysis of what's going on in that so they can compare it with the, the previous one to see whether what the trends are and whether water quality is improving or whether it's being degraded. Now this is over and above special studies that may be done because citizens have brought issues to the attention of DEC or that DEC while they're out in the field sees certain things going on. But this is more of a a general look at what the water quality is and what the trends are. But the department will use, the Division of Water will use citizen scientists to also augment their studies. So you can go on to the DEC website and look at that. Um, if you Google again, WAVE, um, you can look at what the requirements are and how you can become um, a WAVE um, contributor as well. And actually, if you have a particular stream that you're interested in, they can help support um, doing those analysis, the, those kick studies that I talked about, and give you some training on, on how you can do that. The other program is called the CSLAP program, which is Citizen Statewide Lake Assessment Program. But in order to participate in that, you actually have to be part of a a lake association. So there has to be a lake association and then the lake association can, can also contribute data and information on the, the trends and water quality going on within the particular lake that the association has formed. Uh, so 
I think I'm just about done and I wanted to wrap up with uh, another song as well. And uh, hopefully you'll recognize some of the, the water bodies that are identified in this particular song. In fact, let's see if we can do a Zoom sing-along. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to quickly go over what the chorus is. And so that um, hopefully you guys at home, even though you're on mute, you can, you can sing along with this as well. So the chorus goes, la, 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 li, 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 give me your hand. La, 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 li, 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 give me your hand. La, 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 li, 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 give me your hand. There's many a river that waters this land. So we'll start out with the chorus. La, 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 li, 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 give me your hand. La, 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 li, 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 give me your hand. La, 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 li, 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 give me your hand. There's many a river that waters this land. Across the St. Lawrence, forded the old sable, swum the little Tom quick, I follow the racket. The music is muddy, the kinder hook clear, but down by the Hudson I poured it, my dear. Here's the chorus coming around. La 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 lee lee, give me your hand. La 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 lee lee, give me your hand. La 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 lee lee, give me hand. There's many a river that waters this land. From Tassawasa, one's glassy and gliding. The crooked post and kill ones a weaving and winding. The old little hoosick, the course is the plain, and I never will walk by the Hudson again. Here's your chance. La 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 lee lee, give me your hand. La 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 lee lee, give me your hand. La 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 lee lee, give me your hand. There's many river that waters this land. She hugged me, she kissed me, she called me her dandy. Saranax Rocky, the Jessup is sandy. She hugged me, she kissed me, she called me her own. Put down by the Hudson, she left me alone. La 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 lee, give me your hand. La 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 lee, give me your hand. La 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 lee, give me your hand. There's many a river that waters this land. The girls of the Marion. They're plump and they're pretty. The spruce and white and skill has many a beauty. The chaise flows slowly past girls by the score, but I never will walk by the Hudson no more. Last one. La 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 lee, give me your hand. La 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 lee, give me your hand. La 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 lee, give me your hand. There's many a river that waters this land. Okay, Barb. Well, good evening. <clears throat> Get my voice back. Um, I'd like to start with a little intro that I'm a biologist and I've always been happiest outdoors enjoying nature. Following graduate school, I taught biology at Emma Lode School and left to begin my 32 year career at DEC. <clears throat> 
Working in the field of air toxics, one of my areas of responsibility included mercury air pollution, and I was a member of a binational task force with Canada to limit airborne mercury emissions. Informationally, here is contact information for your Region 4 um, Air Engineer, Ben Potter. You can find this information on the DEC website. I hope, uh, can you see that? I can't tell, but hopefully you can see that. The office is located in Schenectady. On a local level, I have helped to write the New York State regulation banning burning waste in burn barrels. When doing public outreach on the problems with burn barrels, I'd explain that the fire rarely gets hotter than 500 degrees. This does not allow complete combustion to occur, resulting in contaminated harmful smoke and soot. Plus many people burn recyclables and garbage, which is prohibited. <clears throat> Outdoor wood boilers can also cause local problems in hamlets and along valleys which trap the smoke due to their topography and wind conditions. An example is along Route 22. In this slide, you can see that smoke is a potential danger to the homeowner. These boilers must burn the appropriate fuel, clean, dry wood, to operate at the ideal temperatures for complete combustion to avoid smoke issues for themselves and neighbors. <clears throat> Some local things that might impact our air quality on the plateau are some proposed projects. One of them includes a waste to energy facility at the old BASF chemical site in Rensselaer, which could potentially emit many pollutants depending on the wastes they are burning. They're applying to process 50,000 tons of waste annually. These emissions would affect us in the eastern Rensselaer County as the prevailing winds blow from west to east, as you can see in this wind rose. Also, there is a potential of seepage from the waste storage so close to the Hudson River. Not a great idea. <clears throat> the southern portion of the plateau faced the threats of a large gas compressor station a fracked gas pipeline and a hard rock mine. The gas compressor station and the pipeline had the potential to emit many dangerous compounds due to leaks. There's also the ever-present danger of explosion as rural pipelines use lower quality pipes. Since the pipeline was to be located 600 feet above our home of 45 years, we were technically in the incineration zone an explosion would make quick work of our home and us. I stood as a protester across the street from the Malden Bridge gas compressor station, which is smaller than the one that was proposed at Burden Lake. And my throat and eyes could detect the volatile organic compounds in the air quite quickly. The hard rock mine would have resulted in increased diesel truck traffic and the mining itself would potentially emit dangerous particulate matter. These proposals were fought by locals and denied. So stay aware, stay involved. <clears throat> As you can see from this slide, air pollution can come from sources locally or far away, such as coal-fired power plants in the Midwest and even the wildfires this year in the West were impacting our air quality. Seeing the Earth from space clearly illustrates how precious the thin layer of our atmosphere is to our survival. <clears throat> I would like to share a valuable tool that is available on your smartphone. The color quote coded air quality index, AQI, is on your weather app if you scroll down. Notice the location is actually our sun's home in Southern California. The reading is high as the result of cool temperatures overnight and a resulting inversion, which I will describe in a minute. Think of the AQI as a color-coded yardstick that runs from zero to 500. The higher the AQI value, 
the greater the level of air pollution and the greater the health concern. AQI values at or below 100, the green, are generally thought of as satisfactory. Above 100, the air quality is unhealthy. At first, for sensitive subgroups of people, such as the elderly, small children, and the respiratory and cardiac com compromised, and then for everyone as the AQI continues to get more dangerous, the red, the purple, the maroon. New York's AQI focuses on ground level ozone and particulate matter, including PM 2.5 and the larger PM 10. In our climate, we usually have high ozone events only in the summer. But back to Encinitas, I wish, and the inversion. This image shows the normal profile of our air layers with air temperatures usually getting colder as you get higher. In an inversion, a layer of warmer air occurs above the ground level cooler air and the up above it is colder air and it acts like a cap trapping air pollution, particularly smog at ground level. Here's your layer of lovely smog. I have seen this layer on many mornings crossing the Hudson River on my way to work. It looks similar to this, a yellowish brown layer of air you do not want to breathe. Most mercury air pollution in the US comes from coal burning power plants. The good news is that many coal fired plants have been shut down as market forces have made green energy a lower cost option. Unfortunately, mercury can pers persist in the environment. As this diagram illustrates, mercury emitted in the air can travel long distances before precipitation causes it to fall back to the earth. And we are very impacted by the Midwest power plants. When mercury enters the waterways, it can settle in the sediments, become bioactivated to form methyl mercury and begin to bioaccumulate. It moves up the food chain and is concentrated in the flesh of the top food chain fish, such as tuna and swordfish in the ocean and pike and trout in freshwater. You must limit your consumption of potentially contaminated fish as advised by the New York State Department of Health. As Fred mentioned, two local bodies of water have sport fishing advisories limiting their consumption of fish due to this mercury pollution. <clears throat> our beautiful loons, such as these two we enjoy swimming and kayaking with on our lake in the Adirondacks, suffer abnormal nesting behaviors from the neurotoxic effects of methylmercury resulting in depleted populations. As we begin President Biden's term in office, many of the regulations that have been repealed or weakened during the past four years can be reversed, some more easily than other. There are four clean air regulations that need immediate attention. Number one, on March 27, 2020, when 21 states had announced stay-at-home orders because of the severity of the coronavirus crisis, the EPA announced that it would be relaxing enforcement on pollution emission limits from facilities, including manufacturing plants, power plants, oil, and gas refineries. The companies were allowed to re report their own compliance with all relevant clean air regulations. Unfortunately, Evidence has proven that this amounts to a license to pollute. Number two, ignoring the recommendation of its own scientific experts, EPA declined to lower the national standard for particulates. Particulate matter is the most deadly air pollutant in the United States. It is emitted by such sources as power plants, cars, and factories. On the plateau, and in the county as a whole, there are a significant number of large and small mining operations. The mining and the accompanying diesel trucks are responsible for the release of dangerous particulate matter emissions. 
These fine particles measure less than 2.5 micrometers in diameter or 1 13th the width of a human hair. They can enter deep into the bloodstream and deep into the lungs, causing inflammation leading to asthma, me, heart attacks, and other illnesses. EPA's own scientists recommended that the limit, which has been set at 12 micrometers per cubic meter since 2013, should be lowered between eight and 10. Even a new standard of nine micro micrograms per cubic meter could save up to 1,220 lives annually. Number three, EPA finalized a rule to undermine protections against mercury pollution or the mercury and air toxic standards, MAPS. Just affected me personally because I've worked on this. These standards protected people against the harmful health effects of mercury and other toxic pollutants emitted by coal and oil fired power plants. Remember, long distances can impact it. Since they were announced in 2011, the standards have decreased mercury pollution from coal-fired power plants by nearly 82% nationwide and need to be reinstated. On March 31st, 2020, EPA finalized the rollback of Obama-era clean car standards, which had increased fuel efficiency and reduced pollution from tailpipes. The new safer, affordable, fuel efficient vehicles rule, safe, not really, raised emission standards leading to more carbon dioxide and particle emissions. It also voided the California waiver, which allowed Can California to enact stricter emission limits than the federal government. 13 states, including New York and the District of Columbia, follow the California standards. Excuse me. Under the new rule, automakers would be required to increase average fuel economy of their new vehicle fleets by only 1.5% every year through 2026, arriving at an average of around 40 miles per gallon. Under the Obama era rule, automakers had to increase the average fuel economy of their fleets by 5% with the goal of hitting 54 miles per gallon in 2026. <clears throat> the even stricter California rule, which we follow, is 54.5 mile, miles per gallon by the year 2025. <clears throat> According to EPA's own data, the Obama era standard has already helped cut carbon dioxide emissions by half a billion metric tons and saved drivers $86 billion in fuel costs. The new standard is expected to release 1 billion metric tons more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, increase gas consumption by around 80 billion gallons and oil consumption by 2 billion barrels. At a time when the transportation industry is already the world's leading source of carbon dioxide emissions. In 2019, trucks and SUVs were 72% of new vehicle sales in 2012, they were 49%. Compared to cars, trucks and SUVs use more fuel per mile. Given the projected $244 billion in extra fuel cost at the pump, as a result of these less stringent standards, the fossil fuel industry is the only one to benefit. The new administration is expected to promote the switch over to hybrid and electric vehicles and increase fuel economy. Here is our son's brand new Tesla, California. <clears throat> also, EPA has scrapped limits on leaks of methane, methane, a potent greenhouse gas from oil and gas operations. We expect this rule to be rolled back. <clears throat> Conclusion. These deadly rollbacks were handouts to polluters and harm public health. During a nationwide public health crisis, when many of those infected with COVID-19 gasped for breath, these actions were not in the public interest. President Biden has already rejoined the Climate Paris Agreement. 
We are currently the second largest emission emitter of carbon after China. So it is very important that we do this. President Biden is expected to promote green energy and reduce the use of fossil fuels as well as stopping new fossil fuel infrastructure. He's already canceled the permit for the Keystone pipeline. Also stopping the exploration and drilling of new wells for fossil fuels, especially in environmentally sensitive areas such as the Arctic and important Native American lands. The most recent actions by the outgoing administration you may not have heard about. One related directly to the Clean Air Act, a rule made final last Wednesday, not yesterday, but a week ago, exempts a large number of stationary sources of air pollution, that is sources other than vehicles, from clean air regulations. This rule designates as significant polluters only those in categories deemed to contribute more than 3% of the total US greenhouse gas emissions. Experts say that this arbitrary threshold would chiefly cover only power plants, leaving oil and gas producers exempt from clean air oversight. EPA acknowledges that the rule is designed to exempt the development of domestic energy resources from environmental oversight. The provision may be especially vulnerable to a legal challenge because EPA never solicited public comment on the 3% standard, a baseline administrative requirement of any regulatory change of this magnitude. Another action was called false scientific transparency. On January 3rd, the EPA finalized a rule ostensibly designed to improve the transparency, quote unquote, of the science underlying regulatory initiatives. However, this rule would require regulatory agencies to downplay scientific research and limit reliance on research that uses private data such as medical records or proprietary research. That would complicate the use of epidemiological studies, which, is typical, which typically uses data to assess health effects of pollution. Expanded to other federal agencies, the rule would undermine health regulations also. Ironically, one former EPA staff member has said that this rule would have prevented the FDA from approving COVID vaccines. Anti-science members of Congress have tried and failed for years to legislate this rule. So this needs to be overturned. <clears throat> to conclude, I feel privileged to live on the beautiful, Fred and I feel privileged to live on the beautiful Rensselaer Plateau. I invite you to explore the many wild places here in Eastern Rensselaer County, whether birding, hiking, snowshoeing, swimming, or fishing, you will feel renewed and enriched by your time in nature. Thank you. Thanks, Barbara and Fred. Um, welcome. Yeah, uh, I'm gonna, um, I'll, I'll go through and ask the questions from the chat. Okay. Or I guess if, uh, unless you want to do that, but uh, I see right from the back in the beginning, when you had the um, the GIS services from DEC up, and you were looking at um, some of the pulling up some of the data sheets. Uh, there's a question um, saying that it was interesting, but they were done in. Uh, 2007. Uh, are there any updates to that information? That that is actually the latest information that's available. Um, I tried to get a hold of DEC to find out whether or not uh, the lists are going to be updated um, more frequently, or uh, I, I haven't been able to find that out. Those are the last studies. Uh, that were posted at this point, and I don't believe that there's been any update. Uh, that's why I'm, I was really uh, hoping that there might be some individuals who would be interested in volunteering for that WAVE program um, to try to get some additional information. 
Now, unfortunately, Dr. Hunt, I don't think is, is with us. Dr. Hunt may actually have, uh, I, I think most people are familiar with Dr. Hunt, who's really the leading research scientist uh, uh, familiar with Ecologist. the plateau. Ecologist. Yeah, ecologist. Um, he, he has done some amazing work. I know he's done uh, a lot of studies on water quality as well. Um, he may have some specific information on specific streams, uh, but that's the latest that DEC has. Okay, thanks. Um, the next question is, do the mercury uh, levels, the levels of mercury affect um, kayakers uh, boating in Dunham Reservoir? No, no. There's no, it's, um, it's the issue is really the, in the sediments and moving up the food chain and actually ingesting affected organisms. There is generally a statewide um, fish flesh uh, limit, um, what's the word I want to use? Advisory um, for all fish um, across all bodies of water um, to limit, to limit the amount of fish that certain groups of individuals, obviously young, pregnant women, so on. Well, it's um, actually women of childbearing age because okay, women not everyone knows they're pregnant. Okay. And, um, and young people as well, children, children. Um, across all bodies of water in New York State. But there are some more specific, more stringent restrictions based on some of the studies that have been done in Dunham Reservoir and on the Plateau and Dyke and Pond are, are two that are very uh, specific in terms of either outlawing no or, or not outlawing them, basically no fish consumption or more stringent restriction of fish consumption or specific species um, in those bodies of water. I did <coughs> work me. with um, Nina Soch, who's in charge of the Loon Research Project in the Adirondacks, and uh, they really were impacted, their behavior. It was very sad. The numbers were really dropping. So it persists in the environment. <clears throat> yeah, I think there's been studies also to find in some, um, like mink, um, right, otters. Uh, uh, yeah, fish also eaters. fish eaters, basically that their um, rep um, reproduction <coughs> um, have been impacted as well because of mercury. But it is it is the neurological. It's a neurotoxin, so yeah. it affects their behavior. And if they don't have the proper reproductive behavior, they don't know where to nest. The loons have to nest in a safe area where they're not going to get flooded. You know, the mating behavior, all these things are impacted <clears throat> by a poison. Yeah. Un unfortunately, I think we're going to find in the future that it's more than just mercury. As I mentioned, there are these forever toxins that um, have come out of the smokestacks in the Midwest and um, water is the ultimate sink. Uh, everything that's in the air or in the ground eventually finds its way to the water and the sediments in the water. Um, those forever toxins are there and it just, uh, they haven't been tested broadly enough or we haven't refined the testing sufficiently to actually identify it. But I mean, I, I think you're hearing more and more and more about PFOA around the state in certain water bodies. Um, now, some of those are specific because PFOA uh, type chemicals have been used um, in those areas, but I, um, I'm confident that there's also air transport that's gone on from, from the production of the chemical around the country. All right. Not to be a downer, but that's the, that's the way it is. Yeah. Um. There's a note here from Tom Carroll about Trout Unlimited uh, has been doing wave uh, macroinvertebrate Great. epilins in the county, and they intend to continue that uh, and do more this year. Um, and the next question is, are trees capable of off-gassing and or storing in, I don't know how the punctuation goes here, and or storing in wood pollutants they take up from the ground contamination? If so, which pollutants and which trees do this the most? Are there any known cases or areas of concern? 
It sounds like another talk. Um, I, I know that they have used um, marshlands specifically for filtering and the removal of certain types of heavy metals. Um, and, uh, and, and what they actually do is then actually remove those plants over a period of time and replace those plants. Um, I would imagine that lots of species, willows, for example, might easily take up some types of heavy metals. And then, but the question is, in order to actually take it out of the system, you have to remove them. They're not going to off gas it, that this is going to continue in the cycle. I think those, those um, heavy metals are going to stay within the, the tissue. And then when eventually, if they were to die and fall back and decompose into the system, they'd be reintroduced into the system. So it's, it's a question of if that's going to be used as a mitigation technique, then it actually has to be removed, harvested, and taken out of the system. OK, uh, John wants to know uh, what are the most immediate challenges we should take action on to protect their watershed? Well, again, I think Barb covered a number of things that have to be done at the federal level in order to protect um, air quality, but water quality, again, because it, it precipitates out. So those, those actions that deal with restoring a number of, uh, restoring science to EPA, basically, having EPA follow the science rather than being a politically driven agenda, a science driven agenda and a human and resource protection driven agenda is, is what really needs to be followed. And I, I hope that we're on again back on the track to do that. Locally, I, I think it's some of the things that I mentioned. I think that um, uh, road salt is an issue um, and is something that if approached, if, the, if, a, um, if properly approached with your town, um, it's something that, that uh, could be addressed on specific roads where streams uh, border those roads immediately. And the, um, depending upon the, the type of terrain that's there, uh, how, how that water runs off from that area, I think that's something that, that can be addressed. Uh, I think that um, road silt, the, the runoff from those roads, how the roads are ditched and crowned really can make a difference in terms of water quality. I think those are two issues that really can be addressed. If addressed properly with your, with your town, I mean, I don't think you can come in and pound your fist and say, this has to be done. I think you have to say that there's a concern and you can show them, if you can show them some specific areas where, where you have that concern and, and how it potentially impacts that particular stream. I think that individuals are more than willing to try to adjust um, how that, um, how the, the dro uh, roads are maintained and how the roads are salted or not salted in some specific areas. I think there is going to be some good science and um, actual applications that are going to come out of some of the stuff that's going on in the Adirondacks right now uh, that'll give us some, some approaches that uh, might be useful in the plateau area as well. All right. Um, are there resources for finding out how the groundwater flows in the town? Yes. Um, uh, the USGS, the US Geological Survey, um, really has some good information on consolidated and unconsolidated aquifers within New York State and specifically within Rensselaer County. Um, uh, DEC also has, they, they actually have developed maps that identify where aquifers are and how those aquifer, aquifers flow. Uh, we have a large aquifer that borders on 
the Nassau, um, um, town of Nassau, just. Stevenson? No, 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 to the east. Um, where where Nassau Lake is on the eastern <laughs> side of that on Nassau Lake. What town is? Yeah, what town is that? Skodak. Skodak. That's on the Sorry. western side. Yeah. Western side. Yeah, I said eastern side. You're absolutely right. Um, there's a large aquifer that shared uh, between the town of Nassau and Skodak. Uh, that's that's mapped out. Um, there's an unconsolidated aquifer that that uh, exists. Um, in the um, in the town of Nassau on the western side of the plateau, right along Route 43, um, uh, those those resources, uh, the maps for those again can be found at the DEC and at the USGS. They actually may also be. Uh, the health department may actually have those as well, the, the county health department, um, because we, um, in some of the, the studies that we did for the town, I, I think uh, Rensselaer County also, um, health department also helped us out on some of those. Uh, the town of Nassau actually has maps that identify the, the aquifers, that the known aquifers anyway, that exist within the town. And they're identified in some of the studies that were put out. Yeah. Re no. Natural Resources Committee report on the, uh, should be on the website of the town in Nassau. If you're interested in Nassau. Okay, the next one is due to the extensive use of nuclear power by members of the Paris Accord, Denver country, do you see an increase in nuclear development in the US, in particular New York, and do you consider it a green alternative? Whether I consider nuclear a green alternative? I do not, mostly because of the wastes and the danger, but mostly the wastes. We have plenty of green options in New York and we're only, the tip of the iceberg of finding new ways to get energy without fossil fuels or nuclear. That's my personal opinion. Okay, is there a state or? <laughs> is there what? I'll, I'll go on to the next question. Is there a state or county level program uh, to address road, road salt and silt? County-wise, I don't think so. The, the state, as I said, has just started um, some studies and there's actual uh, past, the governor signed um, bipartisan legislation proposals that um, identify uh, best practices and um, Again, it's it's a study. They they basically they've got areas that they they want to try alternative um, road maintenance approaches, uh, so that using calcium carbide um, or calcium chloride, excuse me, um, might not be the best way of of um, assuring water quality. So they're looking at other alternatives and application procedures. Um, I don't have a, I don't have any further information on that. I, I bet if you were to, again, Google that, um, I, I think you'd probably get the latest information on the, an acted legislation and what that Incorporate so you know what the what the studies are, what the proposals are. It's 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 over a three year time period. I think that they're going to evaluate things, and then what I what I suspect is what they'll come out with then is some best management practices that will be adopted by the Department of Transport or New York State DOT, and. Um, from that, that will be kind of 
uh, filtered down to the county's application and from that down to town-wise. Um, but I think that's a, a couple of years off. That's why I'm saying, I think we have to keep our eye on that. But in the interim, I, I think you can have conversations about where it's appropriate and where it's not appropriate to limit the amount of salt uh, that might be applied to roadways. Again, safety is obviously a very large concern. We have to be aware of that, but the amount of salt that can be applied and under which conditions it should be applied and specifically where it should be applied, those are all conversations that could be had with towns, highway superintendents, or at least town supervisors or town boards at this point. All right, thanks. Um, there's a question about the Norlight incinerator in Cohoes, uh, people organizing against it, and do you think it's likely the wind pattern brings pollutants uphill to the flat? <clears throat> Probably not, but um, there could be events, there could be weather events that could impact the flow of wind, so there is a potential. I believe that the issues are being addressed by DEC. So I'm hopeful they will get that under control, but obviously the damage has been done, the, the items have been burned and uh, depending on the wind, there's a possibility that some of it was deposited on the plateau. Until we test, we won't know or we see the impacts. That's usually how it goes. And fortunately, it's, it's a lot of reactive stuff rather than proactive stuff. You know, things like pipelines and mines, you can get involved, you can do your homework. But um, some of these things are coming from long distances. The fires in the, in the West where the air was quite dangerous at some points. And I have an asthma, Fred has cardiac issues. So it's like, yeah, we're not gonna go for a hike today. We'll just, we'll hang. Yeah, okay. And the last question I see um, is if an annual award for environmental husbandry were to be awarded to our local politicians, which organization would be best qualified to select the recipient? <laughs> you're, you're looking for an opinion from us? Um, so you're talking political, a politician? I don't know, this is a question from Dan and I read it verbatim. Because a lot of, as Fred mentioned, a lot of the towns have environmental boards, which maybe have the expertise to determine what has been done for their town in an environmentally sensitive way, as opposed to other politicians. Um. I mean, there are there are lot, lots of ways to go about it. If if you're talking about, let's for example, the uh, the Plateau Alliance giving an award. Um, I mean, it, it could be the Plateau itself, uh, a committee formed, and you and you establish criteria, and cooperate. Ask each town to submit. Uh, um, candidates that that meet certain criteria. Um, I mean, I've been involved in committees like that that make make various awards for scholarships and um, locally we've we uh, are been in, been involved with a committee that um, awards local scholarships to students based on environmental issues and nationally I've been involved in um, making awards to students for um, advanced work based on criteria that have been established. And um, so, I mean, that's, that's one alternative. I, I, I'm not certain what the goal is. Well, we know that our supervisor in the town of Nassau has been exceptional in terms of his environmental abilities and, and protecting our environment. Yeah. He's just been politically savvy with who he has to be. And it's it's worked out very well to preserve our quality yeah, we, of life in Nassau. We feel very lucky to have our, you, Dave su Fleming. our supervisor. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't see any other questions. Just a little quip about using weaponry instead of husbandry. 
uh, and some thank yous. I saw some thank yous earlier on for uh, for the your uh, the songs uh, your that you played, which were great. So I think Alice is back, and I'll let her. Right. Okay. Great. Uh, Thanks know, a lot. I just wanted, to, I just wanted thank to thank you both for a really interesting and informative presentation, both of you. Uh, touching on issues that are really important to all of us. So, so we really appreciate uh, what you've told us tonight. Thank you for asking us, Alice. We enjoyed it. Well, we enjoyed it too. Okay, well then I think uh, we're over and I think we will leave the meeting. Okay.